Hello, what I'm going to do uh, for this hopefully short video is talk about two uh, scientists back in the uh, early days, the old days, back in the day. Francisco Reddy, um, living in the 17th century, I think he's actually born and dies in the same century, which of course is not going to be different uh, from many people that back then because they actually didn't live as long as what we're living today. But anyway, he actually is going to try to do an experiment to prove or disprove, he's betting on disproving, the whole idea of spontaneous generation, where living things can come from non-living things. In this case, it was a fly that came from decomposing meat, muscle tissue from all kinds of different animals. And I guess they could have looked at uh, decomposing vegetables and fruit as well, maybe different kinds of flies, but flies from those. But basically what he's doing, and do I have a pen here? I don't have a pen. So let me get a pen. And I guess that's going to work. He does basically three types of tests. He does this one, he does this one, and he does this one. And he actually has two different containers. Um, he's trying to keep everything else the same. The only thing he's changing is the fact that he's not putting a lid on one. He's completely sealing the second one. And this one, he's got cheesecloth on top of it. And then he actually puts these things in, and he waits. And he notices that the first run with these, these two uh, jars, the flies can smell the decomposing meat. They are attracted to this they actually land on it, they start eating it, and maggots start to form, and the maggots pupate. Actually, they go through a couple of instars, and you can look that process up, but basically they puff up their bodies, they break open the exoskeleton, and then they puff up their bodies and form a brand new one. So, spontaneous generations means that, like, that little section of meat right there, uh, I don't know what that next is, that little section of meat right there, it doesn't want me to draw, how about that little section? <laughs> this little section. That little section of meat's going to grow into a maggot. Maggots grow into flies. That would be spontaneous generation. Second one, he's got a lid. Now the lid actually keeps the decomposing flesh inside the box. It keeps or the jar. It keeps the scent of the decomposing meat inside the jar. Doesn't even attract the flies. Um, you know, basically, probably flies were everywhere. Third one has cheesecloth, so the scent of the decomposing meat can go out. Flies are attracted to the scent. Um, they actually land on top of the cheesecloth. They lay eggs on top of the cheesecloth. The eggs hatch. The maggots crawl around for a little while. Maggots die because there's no food for them. Meat stays perfectly safe. No flies in the jar. No flies in the jar. Flies all over the jar. So, let's go on to the next slide. Um, what I'm having my kids do on, you know, for this case is to actually figure out uh, independent variable and dependent variable, as well as hypotheses, experimental groups, control group, constants, how many trials, and conclusion. So, the title of this one, and every, every title should actually have a good descriptive IV, DV. Maybe we should actually start with IV and DV. Independent variable, basically this goes along with time. But what I do, what I tell my kids is that it's what you actually knew when you started the experiment. What did he know for sure? He knew he was going to have lids. He knew he was going to have uh, cheesecloth. He knew he was going to have no lid. So basically it was the type of lids or coverings he's going to have. The DV is the thing that you actually experiment and you determine in the experimentation and that was whether or not there were maggots. And I don't know why maggot has such a bad connotation. They're just like caterpillars. They're just like baby cats, baby dogs, baby pandas, because the, the natural dude just had their panda. So whether they're not, there are maggots. So maggots form, maggots don't. So on this one, we're just going to say presence of maggots. Um, those little squirrely things. I think they're kind of cute. The hypothesis, and gonna, what he's going to say is that the jars that are sealed 
and that can be either with the complete lid or the cheesecloth will not grow maggots. So let's actually go up to the title now. We have our IV and DV. It's going to say the effect of um, the, the effect of the types of lids will affect the presence of I'm running out of space flies. Okay, so we actually have our lid type in there and we have the presence of flies. We have our independent variable, the IV. We have our dependent variable, the DV. Okay, experimental group. Experimental group basically means what did we do in the experiment? Well, we actually had a sealed jar and we had a cheese cloth jar. What was our control group? What did we do that was like normal? We had the open jar. Constants, jar size. Jar shape and material. Now they didn't really have glass jars back then, at least, well maybe rich people did. So maybe he had glass jars. They probably were more like pottery or wood. But uh, he was using most likely a jar that you can't see through, like what you could see in this diagram right here. Um, he had to actually look at the top, which means he had to pull the seal off the top and make sure that the flies don't get in. You could actually maybe see through the cheesecloth, because the cheesecloth just has to be big enough to not let the eggs, the first instar maggots, or the flies get in. So, um, what else did he have? He had the environment the same. He didn't take one of these and put it in a desert. He didn't take one of these and put it in a rainforest. He didn't put one up at the North Pole and one at the equator. He actually had them all on probably the same table, probably in the same room, probably in the same house. He also had the same type of meat. Type and amount. How big is this eraser? How about a mount? Type and amount. So we actually had to have beef in all of them, or chicken in all of them, or pork in all of them, and I don't really think it'd make much difference, but we try to keep the constants constant. He also had, in the environment, he had the same thing. He had flies. Repeated trials. He did two repeated trials. So he came up with three total trials. Repeated mean, how many did you do after the first one? Did a first one plus two, that's the three. In his conclusion, sealed jars, whether or not we have cheesecloth and or a solid seal, grew no maggots. And what did this do? Spawn taneous generation does not occur. So this is what Reddy did. He actually used the, the flies, he used the cheesecloth, the lids, he used the decomposing meat, and proved that there was not spontaneous generation. Next guy is Louis Pasteur. He's in the 19th century. He actually may be born in the 17th and makes it into the uh, excuse me, in the 18th and makes it into the 19th century. He's going to do the same thing. He's going to try to test spontaneous generation, but he's not going to do it with flies. He's going to do it with microbes. He's going to do it with bacteria. And if you ever want to grow microbes, use soup.
Um, he's going to call it broth. Broth basically doesn't have any of the chunks. So you don't have any meat, you don't have any vegetables, you don't have any Twinkies, you don't have anything in there. This is just the broth. And the broth is going to be boiled in both cases. So we actually want to kill anything that's in the broth. We don't want anything inside the broth. This is called a gooseneck flask because it's got this gooseneck. This one had the goosenecks. I can probably do this because I can use the eraser. This one had it also. We were boiling this one. And we boiled this one and then we broke off the top. So we actually went back up there. We got our eraser and we... That was easy. Um, we got rid of the top. Now what this did is this allowed the environment to get into these containers. It wasn't boiled anymore, it cooled off. What hap happened is bacteria is everywhere and this little bacteria piece fell down or got blew in and it went all the way down and splash. And all of a sudden the bacteria was there. And one bacteria you know becomes two through binary fission. They become four, they become eight, and you got to add the other ones in there too. And then we have more and more and more and more bacteria growing. And they start changing color. You get blues and greens and fur and all that stuff. And then we get microbes galore. In the gooseneck, after X number of time, could be a week, could be a few days, I don't remember how much time he used, the broth remained free of microorganisms. What happened? Well, we also had this little bacteria that went through and fell in and slid down the glass and slid up the glass but stopped and then rolled all the way back down and stayed. There wasn't enough space to go up. There wasn't enough movement of air to move up. So basically this gooseneck trapped the bacteria. So bacteria stayed clear. What did this do? Well, it gave rise to another experiment. This experiment is going to um, have the same sort of thing. We have to have IVs and DVs. The DV, the IV is actually going to be the thing you knew before you came into the experiment. The fact that you had a swan or goose neck flask. And your DV, the one you actually experimented, is do microbes Do microbes form in broth? Okay, so our title, we got to use this. So this is going to be the effect of swan neck flask on. the growth of microbes. Okay, our hypothesis, we're going to actually guess that the net swan neck will not allow, oops, will not, I wish we had an undo button. God, I just have to touch it, it disappears. Will not allow microbes to get to and grow in the broth. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, our experimental group. Um, it's going to be swan neck. Our control group is going to be the broken swan neck. And I probably should put flask. Our constants, um, we use the same kind of broth. We didn't use beef broth in one and pork broth in the other. We boiled both. 
to kill whatever was in that broth before. Um, we use the same type of flask, at least to begin. And we use the same time, um, whether it was a few days or a few weeks. He ran this thing one additional time, so he did it a total of two times. Both these experiments for Ready and uh, Pasteur have been done many, 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 many times. And our conclusion, there are no microbes in the flask that still was swan necked. Okay, and what did he learn? Spontaneous generation does not work. So both these guys actually used different critters, different environments, different experimentation to prove the same point. Okay, that does it. So I'm going to minimize this. I guess I'm going to do that by here. I'm going to discard all that writing because I don't want to keep it. And I'm going to say goodbye. Appreciate you stopping by.